Okay, welcome back, and uh, we're going to get through uh, probably three chapters or so because the chapters are pretty short, but I want to go back to something that he said um, when he was talking to Strad later about <coughs> the essay, and you know, he says to him, um, you know, just, it's supposed to be descriptive, so just make it descriptive as hell, and uh, it can't look too good. So, um, you know, maybe put some of the commas in the wrong place so they know it's from me. And here's what he says. He said, I wanted you to think the only reason he was uh, lousy at writing compositions was because he put all the commas in the wrong place. And I think this is kind of an inside English joke about, you know, when you get an English degree, um, and people immediately start getting nervous about grammar or, you know, just technical things. And I've never been a technical person, personally, you probably see that by now. And, you know, I, I can't spell and never have been able to. Uh, but if you think about what all has gone on in the conversation that I'm kind of having with you, this is, this is not... Um, just, oh, did you put the commas in the right place? This is about ideas. Um, it's psychological and it's um, philosophical. And sometimes, you know, you're making analysis about history. And, in, and all of that is revealed in studying the story. So this is the, I, I think that a lot of people don't really understand what they're supposed to be doing in their English class because, you know, I won't go off on all that, but from what I hear from students, they don't have a whole lot of discussion about the novel. And I would just think, well, then what's the point? Really, what's the point? I mean, we're not reading this or making you read this just because we love to read it. It's, it's because it opens the door to many other discussions and you know I've been a part of a book club for some time and I'm the only you know English teacher there but um, I'm, I'm there with a lot of different educated women and it, you know it's, it's okay to pick whatever book they want to pick that's fine but I always notice that if we don't pick something that's kind of like a classic we have nothing to say about it nothing to analyze it's just sitting there just kind of talking about plots and that's what I'm saying when I'm saying that I'm not a fan of just choice novels and reading whatever you're interested in just so that you enjoy it. Because you can enjoy that at home when education is about opening your mind to other ideas and thinking and being a critical thinker. And so as we look at that critically, this is of course it, it, the, uh, the response um, Stradlater has about the essay when he's upset that he wrote about a uh, baseball glove <clears throat> is also kind of, um, I think, really demonstrating education here. He says, you don't do a damn thing the way you're supposed to. And he says, this is why you're getting kicked out. Look, what, look at what you do. You, you wrote about your brother based on this knit. If, it, he did exactly what he should be doing. You know, what, what, what's, the, what's the point of writing a descriptive essay, you know, about something personal if it doesn't reveal um, an inner struggle or story and something doesn't come out of it? But here's, you know, hotshot guy telling um, Holden that, you know, he's back ass, ap, back ass words. And <clears throat> so I'm not used to saying that. And... And this is what I mean about, you know, when people say Holden is crazy. Is it really Holden that's crazy? Is he really doing something backwards? I mean, in the first place, the guy didn't even write the composition, and that's not even coming to his head. He's criticizing what the guy who's doing him a favor wrote and accusing him of being, you know, backwards. It, you know, you're the one who doesn't get it. And so there you have it. And so in this, in this episode, of course, 
I, I talked about last time how he's upset about Jane. And then, so Strad later comes back home and he says, well, you're awfully late for it. She, she had to be back in at 9.30. And notice that he's very concerned about her well-being. You know, she signed out that you're going to get her in trouble. And so what did you do? And finds out that they just sat in the car. And, of course, that makes um, Holden very upset to the point where he tries to hit Stradlater. And he says that he's not very athletic. And he didn't quite connect. He may have just a little kind of brushed him. And, uh, of course, this makes Stradlater very mad, and he's on top of him. He's got his knees in his chest, and um, Holden can't breathe. But Holden won't just shut up. <laughs> and that's all Stradlater wants him to do. He doesn't want to hurt him, but he doesn't. He, it's like he's so angry he can't control, and he's like, don't make me do this. And and what does Holden do but act like a kid, you know, and he punches him in the face and then Stradlater says, go wash your face. Because you could see that Stradlater doesn't want to get in trouble. He was already concerned about Holden smoking. And so who knows what his family background is like, you know, but something about it makes him very concerned. And then he, he feels bad, but um, he, you know, he said, you were asking for it and asking for it and you wouldn't stop. And Holden is like a kid, you know, and he responds with something like, you go wash your moron face. And so here he is just, he's trapped from, you know, boyhood to manhood in, in all of this. And if you were writing about it in terms of a coming of age story, which you could do with the right question with a Q3, is how is this a coming of age story? What is he resisting? Why is he resisting adulthood? What happens to adults? And then what is it about wanting to keep um, this part of him from disappearing, from the child in him, from actually, you know, just disappearing? And, you know, you also uh, get to see that this is where he brings up his brother, Allie. And uh, his brother, his younger brother died, uh, I think he's 13, of leukemia. And this is what I had said before, you know, they, they took him to be psychoanalyzed because he broke all the uh, windows in the garage. He slept in the garage. And now, you know, he's he needs psychological help. And he may need psychological help. But what he really needs through all of this is to have somebody listen to him. If you think about who is he really opening up to, all the conversations that he has, you know, like starting his journey off to um, wherever he's going to go in New York and he meets this uh, mother of one of the students on the bus and immediately starts telling her what a swell guy her son is after he was just telling us that he's a bastard and you know you couldn't pay me to spend any time with him and then he breaks up this story about how um, you know we really wanted him for president and and he gets once he gets going, it's like he can't stop. At the end, when she asks if, you know, well, why are you coming home early? And he says, I have a tumor. And and it's just, and he knows this is, this is silly, but he can't have a real conversation with anybody. But you also notice that when he tells us, the reader, about Allie, he says, you would have liked him. And I think that is, that's kind of the therapy point of this getting this out and we have to be kind of patient with Holden and and forgiving of Holden I, I think that's the way that Salinger would have intended it and yet you know he's asking this mother if uh, she wants to smoke he smokes with her and then he asks do you want to go out for a cocktail and of course you know if, if it were me and I'm looking at this guy you know you wouldn't want to embarrass him but like, you're not even old enough. Are you kidding me? But um, she politely declines. As soon as he gets into a cab, he asks the cab driver if he wants to go have a drink. As soon as he gets out of the car, he goes to the phone booth to make a phone call because he wants to talk to somebody. He almost calls Strat later uh, when he gets to the hotel. He says, oh, maybe I should tell him to come here. 
You know what I mean? So he's, he's constantly looking for somebody to, to be with. Even um, Stradlater is a, a secret slot. He's got a, you know, he shaves twice with, but his, his razor is rusty. Um, looking at, you know, the woman in the, in the train, what does she do? She leaves her bag in the aisle. And of course he thinks this is kind of endearing for a, a woman. He says, you know, women kill me. And, um, they, you know, leave this big bag and don't think anything of it. You notice these little bitty things, um, Alki picks up something personal first of all picking up your personal stuff i had students that used to do that they come in and like it would be something another student gave me and it would be very valuable to me and they'd be tossing it <laughs> you know and it's like can you have that back please but um anyway so that that's just a that had to be something that he picked up from there's got to be a guy somewhere he's probably now dead that was really annoying at valley forge when he went there but just little things like he picked up his um, knee brace and hold it says, you know, he'd pick up your jock strap, strap if you left that out. This is the kind of guy this is. And he, but he takes it off the uh, dresser and he throws it on the bed. And he says, this is the kind of guy, you know, takes it from one place, but then he just tosses it over here. I think this is kind of um, Salinger's um, military background coming out of, of being able to have the the discipline and the respect it seems like nothing is sacred you know and, and people just don't care or they're not respectful they're not considerate of others and and the, just the things that they do and the material things that I I think that kind of drive him nuts um, and, you know, I brought it up before about the way of the pilgrim. I really was not surprised to see that while he is feeling very dejected after um, Strad later nearly knocks him out, uh, he asked, you know, what do you have to do to get into a monastery? And I, I think the ideal for um, someone like Salinger is the the monk the hermit the quiet um prayerful person who does not overeat is not a slob is not is not materialistic not worldly but trying to get rid of ego and and pray without ceasing and and live that kind of like the way of the pilgrim the concept of yes i have to have one foot planted in here but I could also have one foot out I don't have to completely be consumed here Wordsworth um, does well wrote a poem called the world is much too with us and it's something about getting and spending and it's kind of a romantic idea but whenever I think I'm feeling anxious I always think of that poem and I think the world is much too with me I'm too into the drama or whatever is going on. If I went somewhere else alone, you know, by an ocean or for a walk or whatever, then that would change my reality and that would change my perspective. And that would give me a better perspective because nature does mirror what, what, is, what is also true and good. And, um, and that's why we have to try to get outside of our own head and social media and everything else so that we can find that and so that we can hear, you know, if, if we want to hear God, we, we have to get out of our own head. And so anyways, um, there's that that I, I thought about. And, and, it, and the reason why, and the other reason why I point this out is because I'm trying to help you see that you can take little details, or, or what you're asked to do, really, is, is to take those kind of details, those, that list that I just thought about, those little details of the, the messiness, and turn it into an analysis. Um, and and that's, what you, that's what you have to do, because if, 
you only give the plot examples, it's going to sound like a summary, that you're just summarizing the book. And that's, you can't do that. You gotta make an argument about Holden, and then, like if you were even just making the point that you thought that he was a very generous person, um, how he treats the mother, but you have to kind of go a little bit more than that. I mean, the details about why why is he always loaning out his stuff? You know, it, it, it he doesn't seem to ever have everything that he wants when he needs it. Okay, so when you get to chapter nine, really getting to the uh, part where this is not appropriate because um, Holden admits that he's he's a human teenage boy and that he might be horny. So, and that just can't possibly be happening to a teenage boy. That is not right. But I want to analyze very closely what exactly he's saying about that. Um, first of all, I also, I would mentioned earlier about the ducks and, and to, for you to be thinking about it. And uh, he does ask this cab driver, what do you, do you, what do you think happens to the ducks when the lake freezes over? And the guy's like, what? And it doesn't really answer him, but it, it's reoccurring. It'll come back up again, so just think about that question. Why is he concerned about the ducks and what happens to them? Okay, so he gets into this pretty sketchy hotel. Uh, from across his window, he can see what he call, who he calls a very distinguished man putting on ladies' clothes and walking around. And then in another room, he's watching a couple um, squirt their alcohol back into each other's faces, and they just think it's hilarious. And it probably is funny to them if you've the one having enough to drink to, to get you to feel that way. But this is where I really want to see what reading closely into how does Holden really feel about that. Because he says that, you know, in a way, it was kind of a sexy thing to do. And, um, you know, it it certainly enticed him for a moment there. But um, I want to read this one part. He said that the trouble was that kind of junk is sort of fascinating to watch if you don't want it to be. For instance, a girl that was getting water squirted all over her face, she was pretty good looking. I mean, that's my big trouble. In my mind, I'm probably the biggest sex maniac you've ever saw. Sometimes I could think of very crummy stuff I wouldn't mind doing if the opportunity came up. I can even see how it might be a lot of fun in a crummy way. And if you were both sort of drunk and all and get a girl and squirt water or something all over each other's face, the thing is though, I don't like the idea. It stinks if you analyze it. I think if you don't really like a girl, you shouldn't horse around with her at all. <clears throat> and if you do like her, then you're supposed to like her face. And if you like her face, you ought to be careful about doing crummy stuff to it, like squirting water all over it. It's really too bad that so much crummy stuff is a lot of fun sometimes. Girls aren't too much help either. When you start trying not to get too crummy, when you start trying not to spoil anything really good. I knew this one girl a couple of years ago that was even crummier than I was. Boy, was she crummy. We had a lot of fun though for a while in a crummy way. Sex is something I really don't understand too hot. You never know where the hell you are. I keep making these sex rules for myself and then I keep, and then I break them. Anyway, right away, sorry. Last year I made a rule that I was going to quit horsing around with girls. Uh, deep down <clears throat> gave me a pain in the ass. I broke it though, the same week. I made it, the same night. As a matter of fact, I spent the whole night necking with a terrible phony <clears throat> named Anne Louise Sherman. 
Sex is something I just don't understand. I swear to God I don't. Okay. So, I don't know how you old you are watching this. I hope you're maybe at least 16, 18 years old. But when I, when I look at this and I keep seeing that this teenager is calling these sort of things crummy, it's dirty to, to him, okay? And, and I'm not going to get on, you know, some moral high horse or anything like that or, or throw Christianity <clears throat> out there and say, you know, this is why you shouldn't have sex. But I will tell teenagers why they shouldn't, and that is because you can't emotionally handle it. Because psychologically, and you know, sometimes physically, you're not ready. And it should look like a crummy thing to do. And if somebody's taking advantage of you, you should be able to say no, and that be the end of it. Because it's, it's not something that you're expected to do. And I think that's where the teenagers really have a big problem with this, probably guys and girls, um, is that they maybe have these emotions and feelings and they feel more pressure and more like they're supposed to rather than being really true to their self and being honest with themselves and realizing that that's not something, that's not somewhere I'm ready to go. And this is what Holden realizes. And that's why I think it's very unfair for people to judge this book and, and just because the subject comes up, say that it's a bad thing. It's a reality. It is just a, as much a reality as having to go into Spencer's room and, and see an umpy, a, a bumpy old chest and, and realize, you know, our mortality sucks. It's not something that we can just say we don't, doesn't happen. It does. Um, he's confronting this issue because it is part of growing up. And then I think that's um, appropriate for a coming of age book. Because he, especially as a guy, he's, he's got to come to terms with it. But um, just by analyzing the language and seeing that he, like I said before, is respectful of things. He's generous and he's respectful of people. And he's respectful of girls and he doesn't want to see a girl worse than him you know because at least he can count on her to say no and if he can't count on that then where are you and um, and then it makes him feel less of a guy because that's what's expected of him and so uh, see this is all a, a good thing to reconcile and to think about um, and to be honest because this isn't pressuring you to make a bad choice. It's making you think about yourself and hopefully helping you to make a good choice and, and a self-protected uh, choice because you have to do that because people will take advantage of you and they will hurt you. And so I think that's... And, and you do see that. It does kind of blow up in his face in the next few chapters. I think one of the saddest parts of the whole book is when he calls the prostitute over. <clears throat> it, he doesn't do it. Don't, don't worry. Or, you know, think, oh, my son can't read this. No, he, he, he gets the opportunity. He has no idea what to do. Because he's a kid. He's still a kid. And he's trying to be a man. And it's, a, it's very much a struggle. So at any rate, I'll leave it there and then um, start on chapter 10 next time. Okay, thanks. Bye.